Paul Walker's death changed music history. Sounds like a weird statement, but if I asked you what the highest selling hip hop song of all time was, you'd probably guess Drake, Kanye West, Kendrick Lamar, maybe Tupac or Biggie? Nope. The number one highest selling hip hop song of all time is Charlie Puth and Wiz Khalifa with the song See You Again. When I discovered this, I was shocked. Then I saw how most of the top selling rap songs are basically pop songs. There is a little room for debate though. Drake and Rihanna's One Dance is technically dance hall, not hip hop, and Old Town Road is technically country rap or pop. However, I decided to look deeper into See You Again. Hip hop being the most popular emerging genre, surely the number one selling song should have an interesting story. The song See You Again was written and dedicated to the late Paul Walker, the star of the multi-billion dollar film series, The Fast and the Furious. Today I'm going to explain all the events including the tragic death of Paul Walker that led to creating the highest selling hip hop song of all time. Stay hydrated. 2001, The Fast and the Furious. It was a simple idea, badass cars, good looking people. The movie dove deep into the world of illegal racing, partying, and tuned up cars, which is something that many cultures can relate to and have their own version of, which led to a diverse cast so everyone got representation. Cars and good looking people have been a big part of the hip hop community as well. They even casted Ja Rule, who was a mainstream rap artist at that time, as Eddie, who was one of the racers. The movie earned $206 million in worldwide box office, making it a certified hit. Too Fast, Too Furious followed, which introduced Tej Parker, played by Ludacris, a mainstream rapper, who would become a franchise regular. Plus, Ludacris wrote and performed the theme song for the movie, Act a Fool, which would be a part of the soundtrack that sold 500,000 copies. The beat for Act a Fool is an iconic piece of Fast and Furious history, proving how important beat selection is for artists. Luckily, today we have Beattopia, which is the first beat subscription website for rappers and singers. It's basically Netflix for beats. Beattopia has a massive catalog of instrumentals catering to multiple genres such as trap, Afro beats and future pop. You can download five full MP3 wave and stem file trackouts for just $15 per month. And you can release your creations on all platforms, get unlimited streams without paying anything extra. All the beats are professionally produced and mixed with producer credits, including Katy Perry, Gunna, Skepta, and many more. Click the link in the description to check out the high quality beats at Beatopia.com. The second movie outperformed the first one. However, the third movie, Tokyo Drift, which I would consider to be the best, is the least successful of the entire franchise. Why? They casted Bow Wow. Just kidding. The main reason is likely because they replaced almost the entire main cast that the fans around the world loved. However, the soundtrack featured one of the most iconic songs of the franchise, Tokyo Drift by Teriyaki Boys, which was the catalyst to the soundtrack selling 1 million records. Fast and Furious 2009 came back with a bang. Paul Walker and Vin Diesel were back. This is the movie that changed the franchise from cool legal street racing culture to crazy action scenes, fighting terrorist organizations, guns, explosions, and the cast becoming more like superheroes trying to save the day. $360 million in global box office. Yet this one lacked a good soundtrack or even an iconic song to define it, which was very important to the series. They got the best of both worlds in Fast Five, the original cast and good music. $640 million in global box office, double their previous film. This film is shockingly not the most successful of the series, but is widely considered to be the best. They also had the song Danza Kudro, catapult to 5 million records sold in the US alone. The song wasn't made specifically for the film, and it wasn't the theme song either, but the film accelerated its popularity by a lot. How could they possibly top Fast Five? Well, they did two years later with Fast and Furious 6. $789 million in global box office revenue. More money than ever. The theme song, We Own It, was written and recorded by Wiz Khalifa and 2 Chains. It plays during the opening scene in what some consider to be the best opening scene in franchise history. While it didn't go gold or platinum, it's highly regarded by fans and served its purpose of being a hype anthem that gets you pumped up for a great action film. This film was also where they really ramped up the theme of family. The word family was said 10 times in Fast 6 alone, which is the same amount of all the previous films combined. You want to make this family whole again? It's about family. The only way you're going to keep your family safe. But my man's family. To their credit, the cast was like a family now. How many gangster enterprises do you have to destroy with someone before you consider them your brother? Let alone the fact that Brian O'Connor was dating Dominic's sister Mia, making them brother-in-laws. And in the sixth movie, they have a kid together. So memes aside, they are literally a family. Plus the series was over a decade old and we all grew up with them. So even the viewers could identify themselves as being part of the Fast family. 
Unfortunately, just two months after Furious 7 began filming, we got the news that Paul Walker tragically passed away. Paul was attending a charity event for victims of Typhoon Haiyan. Three years prior, he founded a nonprofit after a massive earthquake that destroyed Haiti to help the victims. Reach Out Worldwide was his philanthropic passion outside of cars and acting. I didn't mention this, Paul actually loved cars. It wasn't just for the movie. So I think the, the whole speed car thing is, is it's really in my blood. After the event, his good friend, financial manager, and co-founder of the Roe charity, Roger Rodas, was about to leave in a 2005 Porsche Carrera GT supercar. Paul said he wanted to take a ride with Roger because this car was his dream car. My dream car is the uh, Carrera GT. Just a quick little lap around the block. Nothing crazy. Plus, they were in an industrial park on the weekend. There are no other cars, pedestrians, or really anything in your way. Just a huge open road. They leave the parking lot, head down to the end of Constellation Road, make a ride on Kelly Johnson Parkway, which has a speed limit of 45 miles per hour, and a long bend. Roger punches the gas up to 100 miles per hour, and the two feel the rush of a 605 horsepower supercar speeding through the crisp California air. After coming around the bend, Roger lost control of the vehicle hit a telephone pole, splitting the car in half, then sending it into an inferno in which the two could not escape. How did this happen? Roger is a very experienced driver. However, there were multiple factors that led to the crash. Obviously, they were going very fast. The roads were just a little wet due to the rain on the day before, and on top of that, the car's tires had not been changed nor rotated for at least two years. The other thing to consider is that this car is a lightweight body rear wheel drive car with a ton of horsepower. Even experienced drivers make mistakes when operating powerful machines. His friends, family, business partners, and fans needed time to grieve. Paul was a humbled, honest, and real role model, which is rare when Hollywood is flooded with fakes and wannabes. He was a pure soul that resonated with millions of people all over the world. The filming of Furious 7 was postponed for five months before the crew got together again to finish. The producers needed time to rewrite the script since Paul was only able to film a few of his scenes. To finish the movie, Paul's two younger brothers Cody and Caleb acted as stand-ins and body doubles for his character. They used a combination of CGI and old movie footage to mask Paul's face onto their bodies. They did a great job considering how difficult and new this technology was. Most Hollywood producers would take advantage of his death and sensationalize it to capitalize on people's grief. However, the final scene in the movie is a gracious send-off where Brian is playing on the beach with his son. Then Dominic leaves the beach without saying goodbye, only for Brian to catch up to do one last drive with him, in which they finish by heading down separate roads into the sunset. It was a very respectful and emotional way to gracefully conclude Paul's character in the franchise. But the one thing that makes this scene go from choking up to straight bawling your eyes out sad is the song See You Again playing. Atlantic Records got a call from the Fast and Furious producer saying they needed a Paul Walker tribute song for the last scene in the movie. Atlantic told all their songwriters to get to work. Multiple different artists signed to the label submitted their best original pieces, but one stood out and that one was submitted by Charlie Puth. Charlie Puth went out to LA to pursue his dreams of being a songwriter and producer, but he wasn't just like every other dreamer. Charlie had been making music for 15 years already. His mother taught him how to play the piano when he was four, and he discovered his ability to sing and play just about any song after hearing it a couple times. Charlie would post his covers and some original songs on his YouTube throughout high school. While attending Berklee College for Music and Engineering, he went viral for winning an online competition for singers hosted by Perez Hilton. This got him featured on Ellen, where he performed an Adele cover, and she signed him to her record label, 1111. Bro, Ellen had a record label? <laughs> By the way, his viral video had less than a million views. Could you imagine how many singers Ellen would have to interview and sign today who had around a million views? Anyways, it didn't work out for obvious reasons, and he left the label. Unsure of where his career would go from there, he continued the independent grind until 2015. Charlie got signed to Atlantic Records. Within days of moving to LA, he got the word about the Furious 7 track. Charlie sat at his piano, thinking about his own friend that passed away back in 2012 from a motorcycle accident, thinking about what would Vin Diesel text Paul Walker one last time. 10 minutes went by and he wrote, it's been a long day without you, my friend, and I'll tell you all about it when I see you again. Those exact words in the exact melody, as well as the bridge, 
were recorded as a demo and sent back to the label. Atlantic is pretty sure Charlie nailed it, but they send the files over to the Fast team to decide which song they like the best. The cool part is, the Furious 7 crew didn't just tell Atlantic they picked Charlie's song. They called him and told him that he needed to see the final clip of the film to write something better. Charlie makes his way over to Universal Studios, watches the tear-jerking last scene while listening to his demo played over it. It was at that moment they told him his demo was the one they wanted, and they wanted him to perform it. You have to remember, Charlie is a songwriter, so he writes music for other people to perform. But the Fast team was insisting on him being the performer. I'd imagine if it was up to Atlantic, they would have sent the song to Ed Sheeran, Bruno Mars, or one of their other A-list talents to perform. So Atlantic had to use this massive opportunity as a way to promote a new artist to the world. They had an amazing bridge and chorus, but they needed a verse, Wiz Khalifa. In 2014, Wiz was still in the prime of his career. He had just released back-to-back -back number two successful albums and had a hot billboard charting song, We Damn Boys. Remember I mentioned Wiz actually wrote and performed the theme song to Fast 6? Since he already had a relationship with the Fast producers, as well as being a massive star, it only made sense to choose him. Plus, his verse was amazing, and Wiz has always been a positive and friendly guy. Like, he really is perfect for the track. While writing his verse, Wiz again thought about Paul and Vin, and what the franchise stood for. Brotherhood, family, love, the last ride as a symbolism for death. I know we love to hit the road and laugh. Those were the days. Now I see you in a better place, when brotherhood came first. So remember me when I'm gone, and every road you take will always lead you home. But the one particular line that most likely had the fast production team stand up and say, this is it, was the line, how could we not talk about family when family's all that we got? I literally thought Wiz took this line from something Dominic said in one of the movies. Wiz perfectly summarized the entire Fast franchise and what they stand for in two rap verses. The decision was made. This movie was now dedicated to Paul, this song was dedicated to Paul, and every single Fast fan was eager to see how they handled his passing in the movie. The song was released March 10th, 2015, about a month before the movie came out, which is pretty standard for movie-related music. Furious 7 premiered on April 3rd, 2015, and to no surprise, it is their most successful film to date. $147 million opening weekend, and $1.5 billion, with a B, dollars in worldwide box office. Not bad. Two days after the film, they released the music video on Wiz Khalifa's YouTube channel, which featured some clips of Paul in it. This racked up a cool 10 million views in two days. By the end of the month, it had 135 million views. At one point, it was the most viewed YouTube video in history for just 25 days in 2017. Today, it's definitely in the top five, sitting at a safe 5.5 billion views. 10 days after Furious 7 released, See You Again broke the Spotify record at that time for the most streamed song in 24 hours, and for the most streamed song in a week worldwide. One month after the film, the song went number one in 94 different countries. It's safe to say people all around the world were remembering Paul through this song. It also spent 12 weeks at number one on the US Billboard Hot 100, tying Eminem's record for the longest running number one rap song. By the end of 2015, the song sold 20.9 million units worldwide officially making it the number one selling hip-hop song of all time. Although it was dedicated to Paul and the Fast franchise, the song acts as a perfect song to remember anyone who's passed. It's a song used at people's weddings. Perfectly vague and beautifully written to uplift and celebrate any situation related to family and friends. It's also made for some pretty good meme content on TikTok which helped the song go viral again, boosting its sales. A lot of the time, hip-hop artists have to try and make that one pop rap song to boost their sales and increase their reach. Business as usual. This song, on the surface, may seem like just another soulless radio song, but it's anything but that. The song carries the soul and spirit of Paul Walker. Until we see you again.